Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Siberia. We didn't need to ask for visitors. We were just looking for survivors this morning. I'm very grateful that uh, any of you turned out. Uh, we are, of course, in our seventh lesson of the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. And I would like for you to uh, set a tab at two particular texts that we're going to reference this morning that will aid and supplement our study. The first is Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 and Ruth chapter 2. Now, although we began our exposition last time in verse 21, since it's been uh, a few weeks, I thought we should uh, take a moment and review from where we came from. Our text really began in verse 14 with that word depart, and it closed out our section in verse 23 with that word depart. So we have a nice frame and we are looking at the context and the content of what is within that frame specifically for our instruction today. We'll finish. I told Warren, I said, well, our text is verse 21 and we end in verse 23, so uh, in about five minutes, we'll all be out of here. But uh, I think this will surprise you. There are a, a lot here. Uh, specifically, our inspired historian in the last lesson offered for us the effect of the evil spirit that had set in upon Saul. Whatever that effect was, it was observable to any third party. Verse 15, the words, The Spirit of God for evil is terrorizing you. Thus uh, came the order, verse 16, for a remedy, music, and the man that can play effectively to temper whatever the dark mood that came upon the man. Verse 18, by providence. Let me stop right there to tell you that I have for this class uh, brand new books. John Flavel, The Mystery of Providence. I look back on the 52 years of my Christian life, and Flavel's book, The Mystery of Providence, has got to be one of the top ten most influential books on my life. I knew the sovereignty and providence of God, but I had never thought of it in the way he sets it out where you were born, where your family came from, your employment, your health. All the things of providence and His mystery that He sets forward in a compelling style. Here is a man 300 years with the Lord and he still is speaking to us. So, please, take one. The story of the rise of David is the story of divine providence. Remember, the sovereignty of God is His total control from the beginning to the end. But providence is different than that. Providence is the how it comes about. How the pieces fit together. Flavel says, a man who doesn't look for a providence misses a providence every day. 
And so you and I are here on this cold day in January 2024 in the providence of God. So, verse 18, by providence. An official has observed David playing the lyre, played with skill. And verse 19, by order from the visible king, he took David to serve him with music. Which brings us to the beginning of our morning text, verse 21. And we really start with that word entered or came, which punctuates David's arrival and tells us that geographically we are in a different location than we've been before. No longer Bethlehem of Judah, but Saul's hometown or hamlet, Gibeah of Benjamin, which has its all consideration as well. A different place for David carries a different culture, a different style. My son went off to the university 18 miles north of downtown Chicago. And he would amuse me when he would come home for holidays or we would visit him. He would throw out these expressions or euphemisms from the students that were there at his university. Really just a different culture, a different place. Up north, 800 miles away, far from the neighborhood that he grew up in. And so consider this. David comes to this Gibeah of Benjamin. He doesn't know anyone. Not a soul. He's just a kid from a scrawny little town in Judah, which highlights for us this word loved right here. See, it didn't take the people long for, and specifically, the big guy. I think we can use that term. Well, I know we banner it about politically today, but the big guy, he loved him and noticed him. Uh, and further, for a historic note, uh, for the first immediate family. He was the one that loved David first. Soon it will be recorded that his son, Jonathan, the heir of the throne, will love him too. And Saul's own daughter, Michael, 1 Samuel 18.20, will have the same term attached to her name regarding David. In the last lesson, we talked about dropping your child into a place, a school, an organization, various and sundry groups, wherever they may be, a representative of you, a representative of your family, of your home, a child of light dropped into a dark place. Certainly a new place, but it was very dark for David. Consider, in the tent of Saul, an evil spirit lurks there. But like most of our experiences, everything with energy and an attitude, it starts off very well. And I think in our last lesson, we noted that with the narrator's interplay. David came to Saul, and David attended Saul, and Saul loved David, and David became a weapon bearer for Saul. Style-wise, it's very interesting. The terms and the names are interchangeable. David, Saul, Saul, David. Like hand and glove, everything seems to fit together. Verse 21, the term attended is literally to stand before and translated that way in various versions. 
or you may have entered or entered into service. Finally, look at that word became. Now, we know that term. We know that term for our study of the Proverbs. It's not one. It's not two. Between is become. It's a transition word. David didn't start off as an armor bearer. He started off as a musician. But he transitioned. He became. He promoted. See? Armor bearer for the first king of Israel. And so here are all the verbs. Verse 21. Came, attended, loved, became. Snappy, quick tempo, thrusting David forward in the story. Think of that first message, hypothetically of course, of David communicating with his father. That first postcard, letter, or call from home. Son, how are things going? Oh, Dad, great! Everyone is so friendly and warm. They've made provision for me. And the king speaks to me every day. Why, Jesse, just like you, would be so excited you could hardly sleep that night. Thanking God for all the arrangements and the preparation and how things had fit so well. Verse 22. Now we mark the advancement. From verse 21, entered into service, notice the command, remain in my service. So look at the picture. The chosen king, David, is serving the rejected king, Saul. And here, I think we need to stop and contemplate the significance of that point regarding David. I think it would be good to just survey where we're going from here. From this time forward, we all need to know that David will never, ever under any circumstance, no matter how he's treated, turn on Saul. Never. He will never lift a finger to hurt and to harm him in any way, shape, form, or fashion. David practiced hesed. Loyal love. Covenant loyalty. Kindness what the New Testament simply calls unconditional love. And that was David's manner, and that was his concourse regarding the king. So, let's go back to that word loved in verse 21 again and ask this question. Well, who changed? Well, we all know the answer to that. It was Saul, of course. But let's let this text teach us something here. The Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says, As it depends upon you, as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. All men. Not some men. All men. I may not like you for what you did to me. You lied about me. You misrepresented me. You talked down to me. You talked behind my back. You did hurtful and harmful things to me. But here's the reality, biblically. My emotions and my feelings are not where I set my life. I set my life on the Word of God. And the Word of God tells me I must pray for you. I must be kind to you. 
And that takes the supernatural life, of course, the life of Christ. But here's my own testimony to you this morning as I have learned to do that over the years. God has revealed to me my own hypocrisies, my own wickedness, and has shown me what a phony I really am. Much of the way that people have treated me, I treated the Lord. And it was a very sanctifying experience. I sat across from a guy that had a very rough upbringing in December. Real smart guy. But had a lot of rough edges on him. And uh, I told him that story. And he looked at me and uh, he said, I hear you, I hear you. And he squinted down and he said, but you know, I'm just not there yet. I said, Charlie, none of us are anywhere yet. We're all struggling. We're all in different places. But the important thing is that you talk to the Lord about it. Keep that conversation with Him going. He's the one that changes lives and not us ourselves. Now, I mentioned to you in the last lesson that there was more to this key word to sin. Remember in chapter 16, there were two key words. One was to see. The other was to send. Now, I want to fully develop the verb to send as it comes to us in 1 Samuel chapter 16 here. It occurs six times in the chapter. Let's review this together. Beginning in verse 1. Go, said the Lord, I will send, send you to Jesse. Verse 11. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. Verse 12. And Jesse sent and brought him. Verse 19, Saul sent messengers to Jesse. Verse 20, Jesse sent gifts back to Saul. And now here, verse 22, the last use of this verb to send, Saul sent messengers to Jesse. I know that this is your first look at this material, but I pondered this for some time. And here's what I saw. Jesse, in some form or fashion, is always connected to this word to sin. Now, over the Christmas holidays, I thought about that. I thought about that a lot. And here's what I came up with. Jesse is a clearinghouse. He's a clearinghouse sending, receiving, 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 sending. Everything is flowing through Jesse somehow, some way. The best illustrations are always from the Bible themselves, so let me give you one. Luke chapter 9, Mark taught us the feeding of the 5,000. Luke 9, 13, he had 5,000 people in the congregation, began to be late in the day, and the disciples said to the Lord, let's send the people away so that they can get something to eat. And remember, he looked at them, and he said, you feed them. You do it. So they scurry around. They find a loaf here, 
a loaf there, a little boy has a fish or two. And Jesus takes it and He blesses it and they distribute it. They received from the little boy and they sent out to everyone. The disciples were the hands and the feet for delivering that blessing. They were the tactile expression between the Lord and the people. People didn't see the Lord. They saw the disciples. They saw them working. Them carrying the baskets. Back and forth. Back and forth. Here and there. They were the ones that were carrying on the work. It really circles up, doesn't it? When a person really thinks that they have a lot to offer the Lord and His service, they have nothing to serve at all. I don't care how smart you are, how many degrees you have behind your name, you really have nothing. You're like the disciples. They had nothing. And yet here they are in the midst of it all. The will of God is flowing through this man, Jesse. This man's personality. Where does it occur? In his daily life. In his daily concourse. In his routines. He's not in the temple getting a vision. He didn't hear the Lord speak from on high. He didn't see a burning bush in the midst of the wilderness. No, he's just carrying on life. But look at him. He's in the midst of it all. In his daily routines of life. Back in 1979, it was a hot August afternoon and I got a phone call. There was a man on the phone that I had never heard of and wouldn't know him if he walked right up to me. He introduced himself as Larry Hairston. And uh, he said, my wife Judy and I have been praying for some time about you teaching a Bible study in our home. Well, I thanked him, but I said that the elders had uh, given me a uh, young married class and it meets in the parlor on Sunday and I really didn't have any more time to devote to such an affair. There were a lot of better teachers than myself at Believer's Chapel, and I dismissed the whole matter, but he wouldn't get off the phone. He insisted. No, we are quite confident, he said. We have prayed about this for some time. And you're the person. So I showed up that first night, and there were 25 people in his home. The house was packed. They had uh, folding chairs put in the den. Uh, people packed the couch and every available chair. Some women sat in the kitchen table, offsetting the room. I sat in front of a fireplace, a hearth, I taught Colossians, which I knew nothing about. But from there, it began to grow. More people and more people came. Sometime along the way, a man died of a heart attack in that study. I can remember his face right now. He always sit to my left on the couch. I conducted his funeral. 
And from that uh, Bible study, we had uh, a number of people get baptized. And as you can imagine, a lot of those people, friends, neighbors, wherever they attached themselves to the Harrisons and the Harrison family, they made their way to Believer's Chapel right here in the class like this. They just became the point of contact for people. Coming, going, going, coming. And so I asked myself, what does God do with a life like that? Well, if you read First and Second Samuel, Jesse's son, the least of his sons, becomes the king of all Israel. How's that for a providence? But let's be practical. Our children are not going to be kings and queens. But to the person that makes themselves integral, sending, receiving, to what's going on, advancing God's work, here's what's going to happen. You're going to carve out a testimony for yourselves. Uh, both here and in the future. The blessings of God. That's what happened to me. I delivered nothing in the Hairston home. They delivered everything to me. I got to see a son and two daughters raised in a Christian home. I wasn't from a Christian home. But I got a bird's eye view, a 50-yard line ticket. And I advanced greatly as a result of that relationship. You live that way, my friends. And the future blessing of God will be upon your life in such manifold ways beyond what you could ever imagine, both here and in all of heaven. Let me show you that. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of... Abraham, right? I mean, he's the progenitor of the race. No? Well, of course, not Abraham, it'd be Isaac. I mean, he's the son of the promise, right? No? Well, it's Jacob then, the father of the tribes. No? Oh, it's Judah. Judah the lion. The chosen one from the sons of the tribes. No? Well, then it's Boaz. No. It's Obed. No. None. Not at all. Look who it is. Jesse. And a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Think about it this way. If you could hypothetically interview Jesse, your conversation would be something like this. Oh, Jesse, well, we all know you. You're, uh, you're the father of David. Uh, you are the one that has been written about by the prophets and, and mentioned among the apostles. And he'd look at you and he would say, prophets? Apostles? I don't know any prophets or apostles. Well, of course. Uh, but that's hundreds of years later. Uh, but you know, I Isaiah and Matthew, there it is. I don't know any Isaiah. I don't know any Matthew. My friends, do you see 
what God can do with a name and a life that just puts himself in the midst of the activity. Coming, going, sending, receiving. Do you see how God can honor a man, a wife, and a name? Become that intersection for people. Determine you're going to do that for the rest of your days. You're going to be the facilitator for the things of God. The tactile point of contact. And you will find, based upon what God has showed us in His Word, you will have blessings upon blessings upon blessings far greater than you could ever imagine in your life. Now back to our text, look at what's happened. In verse 22, verse 19, we had messengers for the first time, but there, and now here, it's messengers a second time. To what? To remain, to attend. Literally, to stand before me. They're in the presence of the king. From a guy who knew no one. No one. Look how well David has worn to the group that he is with. And he is a perfect model, is he not? For what our lives should be about. Consider. He comes to a place. He gives his gifts to a place. And look at the effect upon the place. See that word, found favor? That word is hen. H-E-N, like a female chicken. Hen comes from above, like a rain shower. It comes from above and it comes before you to guide and guard and bless your way forward. It is God sovereignly affecting someone's mind, heart, emotions and being made favorable for you. Have you ever said... For some reason, for some reason, this person liked me. And it goes without explanation. Well, here is this same word, hen, found in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 10. See, she's like David. She comes into a place not knowing anyone. She didn't even know whose field she was in much less have a map to guide her there. Providence brought her there. And she says to Boaz, Ruth 2.10, Why have I found favor in, in your eyes that you would take notice of me? I'm just a foreigner. There's no explanation for this. None at all. This shouldn't be happening. She's from Moab. And yet, look what happened. She found favor right there. And there's one other biblical text that has to be glazed across Ruth chapter 2 and verse 10, and that is Proverbs 22.1. You remember Proverbs. How much better is a good name than silver and gold? You look at whose name and reputation had preceded her. Verse 11. Boaz says, I have been told all about you what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death 
of your husband. Look at those words. I have been told. What is that? I have been told. That's testimony. That's your name. That's your reputation. That's who you are. And for Boaz, the name Naomi and her subsequent behavior, this little girl from Moab, well, that was the gold standard as far as he was concerned. That was better than an American Express Platinum card. Your name with that card and signature represents credit for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. <coughs> That's testimony. And Proverbs says, that's better than gold or silver or any form <coughs> of liquidity in commerce today. See, it's all about the favor of the Lord falling upon a faithful person, falling out in front of you and showing you amazing and unusual kindness. So, back to our text here. Verse 23. See what a model David is? He takes his gift for music, and he serves. What gifts has he given you? Then serve with them. Can I be so literal as to say, play for the king with what he's given you. Play for him. You only have an audience of one. And be faithful to do that for him. It blessed Saul. But Saul is just a man. And what we are offering is to play for the King of Kings. Will you take your gift in 2024 and for the remainder of the time that He has left for us and play for Him? Will you do that? If you do, I have an exhortation to close with. I'm actually going to get us out on time. Amazing things that are taking place in 2024. Here's my text. It's Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. <coughs> the King of Kings is speaking. And hear His word to you and me. He says, look, I am coming soon. And my reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what he has done. Will you serve him? Will you get in the middle of people and serve? Will you be right there and press the flesh for them? Yes, you. You and your weakness. Yes, you and all your insecurities. Yes, you who have really nothing to offer. Will you do it? For the king sees. And the king knows. And he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him and love His appearing. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for Your goodness to us each and every day in Christ Jesus. Thank You for working so powerfully in each and every life here. 
to translate us from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light and to set us on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ for eternity. We are so grateful for Your loving kindness to do that with the likes of us. Simple us. To the honor and glory of Your name forever and ever. Amen.